in an absolute pivotal moment for Arsenal's season. Manchester United come through in a penalty shootout, meaning Eric Ten Hag will most likely stay as manager when we go to Old Trafford. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Alex Smith, the Gunner. I almost tripped over that, but you get the idea, right? I was panicking there when that fourth goal went in for Coventry, which VAR ruled out correctly uh, for toenail fungus being offside. Just shows you toenail hygiene, very important. Could win you an FA Cup tie. Uh, I was worried that Ten Hag would be buried under Wembley and uh, not available to manage Manchester United when we go to Old Trafford. But I think those fears have been allayed. I, I suspect he will still be there, and that should be just the lift we need. But we have business to attend to before that. We have to discuss the Wolves game that was. We have to look forward to the Chelsea game that will be. Maybe discuss a few bits and bobs from the things that were in Arsenal this weekend that were kind of interesting and give you an update on a major, major event that is coming for all of you to hopefully uh, participate in, if possible. But first, it is incumbent upon me to introduce Clive. You can find him on Twitter, Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. Hello, indeed. I do want to thank the Chicago Gooners for hosting myself and Paul uh, and obviously Big Mike and um, and uh, Tim and everybody who was there for the Gooner Palooza and the, the live podcast and just a, a fantastic event. You know, getting together with people in person is the best. It's just the best. And I know there are a lot of people listening who aren't able to do it as often as they'd like, but any chance you get to do it, it's just a reminder of how special this whole thing is. So thank you to everybody who was there. I had a blast. I did drink Malort. I do regret it. I did a lot of karaoke. I don't regret it. So two updates. Update one is about our big end of season event, and we can officially announce now that it is coming. It will include our blog. Andrew, Gunner Blog, James, and hopefully, as importantly, maybe less importantly, but still relevant, Clive, Tim, Paul, and myself. Uh, it has now become a seasonal tradition. We do it on the last weekend of the season, so it will be the Saturday night before the Everton game. This year, though, we are not at Union Chapel, which is sad. We shed a tear for that, but we are at the Alexandra Palace Theater. Uh, I am told that is sometimes referred to as Ali Pally by people in the know, but the right. Alexandra Palace Theater. We will be putting tickets on sale Tomorrow, Tuesday, April 23rd for patrons. Uh, and then the following day, Wednesday, April 24th, uh, for Gen Pop for everybody. Uh, so uh, if you're a patron, you, you get a first shot at those tickets, which I think is the least we can do for your support for the pod. And thank you for that. Um, but if you're unable to support in that way, and we totally understand that's the case for some people, no problem. I think given the size of the, the theater, there should be some tickets available on Wednesday is my hope. And so everybody will get a shot to, to show up there. And we had a very special guest last year, Ian Wright, obviously everyone knows that we'll try to make this special, but I think it'll just be special. As I said, to get together, we'll have drinks with people, you know, after the show and it, it just turns into a night of revelry and celebration of the season. And who knows, maybe there will still be something on the line when Everton come to the Emirates. And what would be really funny is when Manchester city lose their next four games consecutively and Liverpool and Arsenal win out. What will be funny is if Everton are safe and they come to the Emirates, knowing that a heavy loss guarantees us the title over Liverpool. I, for one, would enjoy that scenario <laughs> very, very much. Um, so we will see what happens there. The other announcement really quickly. So as of time of recording, the fundraiser is currently at 116,141 pounds. We have literally, okay, 9,000 pounds to go to max out our matching donations. Okay, the 25,000 pound donation goes in this week. If you can get us nine more thousand pounds somehow, we will get to 150,000 pounds. And that means the 150,000 pound matching bid will be matched every single pound. And we will have done 300,000 pounds for the child refugees, the Zattery Refugee Camp and the Coaching for Life program. It is an astonishing contribution. And I think given that this thing kicked off after we had lost to Bayern and lost to Villa, the mood around the football was down, didn't stop anyone from saying, I still want to do something good for the world, for humanity, for this community, and I just cannot thank you enough. It means the world. We will draw the VIP ticket to the Bournemouth game uh, at the end of the week. So final week to give. If you can get us nine more thousand somehow, uh, we will max out all our matching donations. So we'll leave it at that, uh, except that Clive has raised a finger. And when that <laughs> finger goes up, you stop talking and you say, Clive, what would you like to add? I, I may. I just look through the comments on, on all the donations, and I do it every now and again, and it's incredible people's stamina and their kindness and the words that they put alongside. I wish we could reply to every one of them, but some of the words are just beautiful. And I have to say just my own personal thanks. There's so many things happening in the world 
and there's so much things that reasons not to do something like this and people are finding a reason to do something like this. I just want yep. to say thank you. And you, you said the word stamina. If I was a professional, I would use it as a segue to talk about rotation and why doesn't, why doesn't Mikel Arteta <laughs> rotate more? What, what about the stamina of our players? But I'm not going to do that. I want to start in a weird place. I, I just want to quickly touch on two non-Arsenal things because I think they're fun and I think they're worth touching on quickly. So the first is just that FA Cup semifinal between United and Coventry. Um, can I just get like 90 seconds of your thoughts on that and obviously the the offside call at the end and just the general calamity that is Manchester United. I mean, they are an absolute shower of shit. Yeah, I watched it in the bar full of Man United people and I had that smug Arsenal top of the league face on. Just It needed to be, to be punched, you know, and um, <laughs> as, their, as their world just sort of folded around. And to be honest, mate, no one was watching the game because it was, it was done. It was done. And then suddenly you saw this you saw this thing forming in front of your eyes. And it, it wasn't by luck. I mean, Coventry played really, really well. They were fitter. They were faster. They had a good plan to get down the sides for cutbacks. I mean, this was good stuff. And if you're, honestly, in some ways, everybody won in a strange way because the cup final probably needed to be a, a bigger cup final. You know, people can debate that if they think I'm right or not. May United didn't win, um, but they won the game. Coventry didn't win the game, but they won everyone's hearts with how they played. And I just think it was just a fantastic performance from them. Coventry went to Wembley last year in the playoffs and lost to Luton on, on, on penalties. And that was tough enough. This one is very tough, but that club's on the way forward. And um, one of our ex-academy players, Ben Chief, played for them. And I thought he was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And... Very unfortunate to miss the decisive penalty. I, I really, it almost like rekindled my, uh, not rekindled my love for football, but it was so good to see a lower league team do that well against against uh, the biggest club in the world, he says, air quotes. So yeah, it was good. Mm. I, I got to say, I don't, I, I think Ten Hag is an idiot. Like I really, really do. But I don't think he's a, a, a feckless, moronic coach. Like he must know how to coach a football team. So my only conclusion can be that there are players that aren't playing for him. Because if you kick the ball three yards past the Manchester United attackers, you have 60 yards of green grass in front of you to run into. I mean, Casemiro is not trying. He's not trying. And that didn't just extend to his open play, lack of running around. His penalty said, I'm not trying. Everything about his game right now says, I, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. <laughs> he just does not want to be there. So I thought it was really, really interesting to watch that. It's comical. I think obviously he's going to go, but as long as he's there, teams are going to continue to get 20, 25, 30 shots a game against them. And it's, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. I the, just hope we do, Elliot, when the moment comes. We will. We will. I oh, and by so. the way, we will. A hundred percent. They have no ability to stop. I mean, the only thing they do well is counterattack. And so the only downside, right, is when that, when, when a big club plays against them, they get to play, minnow football, which actually suits them a little bit because it forces them to yeah. be more compact. Um, I think if you sit off them and let them come to you, if you low block them, you could get 30 shots a game on them like with no problem. Um, so obviously the, the, the game ends with a, a bit of a controversy. I don't know where I stand on this because at the end of the day, if we're going to do the VAR thing, then that's offside, I think. And you know, a yeah. lot of people said it shouldn't be offside, and I understand it. But having said that, I kind of think if there was no VAR, the flag goes up because with the naked eye, it looked very offside. Like I thought, oh, well, that was offside. Yeah. So I, I think it might have wrongly gone up, but because it stays down, then when it's very close, it looks close. Look, I don't know that we want toenails being an offside, but once you decide to draw lines, the lines are going to be as accurate as possible. Maybe the solution is you don't draw lines. And if it can't, if the naked eye can't judge whether it's on or off, then the benefit goes to the attacking team, which was sort of always how the offside rule was implemented. I don't know about that, but I do know that VAR comes into the headlines this weekend because of the Forest game. And so before we get to Wolves, I just want to ask you about Forrest's tweet, which any one of us could have written, except <laughs> that's the problem. Any one of us could have written it, and it was on the official club account. If you haven't seen it, you can look it up. But essentially, um, it was like a fan raging against VAR and accusing the VAR referee of being a Luton fan, which is why they ruled in favor of Everton and against Forrest. Um, Dale Johnson has come out and predictably, you know, given his view that 
Duvar was right about everything. Um, <laughs> n- not only right about everything, but also just morally and ethically right and run by good people who deserve <laughs> to uh, be philosopher kings ruling our society. So, Clive, thoughts on the forest admin <laughs> going full fan on Twitter? Yeah, there's, <clears throat> there are two words you can't say to a referee, right? You, you can't call him a see you next Tuesday, and you mm-hmm. can't call him a cheat. You can yeah. do anything else. I've just, you know, you can say anything else you like to them, but you can't say them two words to them. You just can't. And the cards will come out and they will circle the wagons. So the moment you sort of question someone's integrity, that's it, mate. They're not listening. Ears are shut. It's over. I think the fact that Clattenburg's at Forest and some of the referees may not like him and may not understand his role, that's going to make them circle the wagons even more against Nottingham Forest, who are, seem to be at at odds with the Premier League full stop, obviously over the um, deducted points, etc. On the three incidents, I'd say one's a definite. Um, the first one, when he kicked through the back of the leg, I think you could say, maybe. The handball, a little bit lucky, you know, not to be given, but I can live with that one. But it's the last one, the one when he takes him from behind. I mean, that should just be a penalty. And everyone said it this morning, so I'm only repeating the analysis from yesterday and today. Once the referee circles, he got the ball, and the VAR then sees he hasn't got the ball, it should be sent to VAR. And to me, I was saying to my mate Mark at work today, we had our pre-pod chat, I said to him, for me, decisions will always be sort of interpreted differently. But when you have a failure of process, that's the stuff mm. you need to fix. When the referee says he's got the ball, at that point... It's a failure of the VAR process not to make him look at that again, to help him, because all he was doing was doing his best job to see what actually happened. So yeah. failure of process, that shouldn't be happening, mate, and that's the stuff they should be most mad about. They should have targeted their tweet towards that, because I think they'd have got a lot more sympathy. Yeah, and I, I mean, the, the fundamental um, controversy is that they had flagged and claimed that the VAR is a Luton fan, and that that would make the VAR incapable of objective analysis of the of the refereeing decisions. Look, my take on this is slightly nuanced, unfortunately, which means everyone's going to hate it. But it's that <laughs> I do think that the PGMOL is not currently fit for purpose. I think there's a lot of reasons why. I think the way they recruit is not correct. I think the Premier League needs to take some ownership and control over this and start bringing in the best referees from around the world and paying them top wages so that when you go to the Champions League, the referees seem less good <laughs> than the Premier League yeah. referees. The best referees in the world should be playing in the league with the most uh, refereeing in the league with the most money. N- not that money is the most important thing in the world, but there is no shortage of resources to recruit the best. And I understand grassroots football, and I understand the importance of developing things in grassroots football, and I understand criticizing referees makes these grassroots puts grassroots referees in jeopardy, in danger, literally in danger physically in some cases where they're assaulted and attacked. Like It's a bad moment for all that stuff. But in terms of running the game, you can't run the game where you have th- this little consistency and um, th- this little trust in the process. But the reality is also that referees are always going to make controversial calls and someone's always going to feel wrong by it. My ultimately nuanced take is I don't think a club account can put this out in part because we live in a conspiratorial moment and I think it is red meat for people that want to see conspiracies and want to question the integrity of the the entire competition. That's not good for any of us as fans. Once we believe the integrity of the competition is lost, none of us win. It's not, there's no winning to say, oh, well, it was rigged from the start. If it's rigged from the start, why are we watching? Why do we care? And so I don't think it's good to bring the integrity, call it the integrity of the competition in question. The other thing I would say, just point blank is, if you're one of the clubs, you have an audience with the PGMOL and you have an audience with the Premier League and you have the halls of power in which you walk to go talk to people and rally support and find a way to change it. You know, it's like when people in parliament or in Congress or whatever, you know, complain about the process, like you're the power, you're power, <laughs> go, go fix it. You know, so I don't know, Clive, I just, I don't love stoking conspiratorial uh, beliefs, especially in a moment where I think we're all very vulnerable to them because the dynamics on social media, I don't like calling yep. into question the integrity of the overall competition. I think the referees, and I've always said this, more than being bent, are just not good enough. I think that the process by which VAR intervenes in the game is murky and unclear. And so consistency has been a problem. And there have been process errors. 
So all things being equal, that's where I stand on it. We can move on to the Wolves game, but I'll give you a final thought on it. I just think let's get this better without fully calling into question the integrity of the competition overall, you know? Yeah, process needs to be better. And I often ask myself a question, how robust are the processes around bar? You know, have they popped off to PwC to get them looked at properly? You know, it just makes me wonder that, that these guys have been brought up refereeing games from grassroots right to top level. Then we put the same guys in charge of all the processes. I just want to see, you know, better quality people around this all because we I think your point around being the best league in the world, well, we need the best admin and officials around the game. And, and no matter where you got to go to get them and pay them, there's enough money sloshing around. When you see the agent fees going out the door, you can put a simple, you know, sort. let's sort this out first. You know, let's make sure we have the very, very, very best people. Maybe from other industries that are really process driven that can look at things and really make them better. Um, if you want to be the best, you've got to pay for the best. You've got to really get the best quality people. And that's where you guys need to go to help these guys because they know the game, Elliot. Really. They love the game. They know mm. all the rules. We don't know the rules. We love the game. We don't know all the rules and scenarios. They do, and they've studied for years in different in different scenarios, literally on pitches, under pressure. They've done this. They've, they've earned the right to be here, but they need to be supported. They need to be open to be supported and not be a little thief from there. So... If you want to grow the game, we have to broaden the quality people around the people that we rely on. And I used to play football Sunday mornings. I turn up, there's no ref. Mate, it break my heart. We can't play a game without them. We have to recognize that. Right? There is no game without them, and we have to bring them in. You know my views on this anyway. Mm, well said. All right, so, I mean, we're 16 minutes in. We haven't talked to Arsenal, and I apologize for that. But I do feel, honestly, at this point, those are the stories that are really dominating a lot of people's thoughts. Um, the Wolves game was actually not much of a story because I think it was a very dominant performance in a game where one team had very little to offer. <clears throat> the other team had very little left in the tank. And so I think we did what needed to be done while controlling it. There are a few really interesting talking points, I think, in it vis-a-vis -vis how we might set up for Chelsea and a few interesting talking points vis-a-vis -vis sort of rotation and squad use coming out of the game. The game itself, not a game of big incident. So... We can just sort of start, I think, with this, Clive. I I don't know if we can connect to what a player feels because fans sometimes feel things more acutely than players. For players, it is a job. They have to pick themselves up. They have to get their job done. But I saw a lot of people tweeting, talking, not just tweeting, but talking, you know, people I mm -hmm. physically talked to <laughs> about the season like it was over after the Bayern loss. Yeah. You know, that it was league's gone, Champions League's gone. Who are we going to sign this summer? Already talking like that. If the fans are thinking that way, then there's certainly, at least in the corner of some of the players' minds, a, a bit of that looking to the future stuff going on, a bit of resignation. And Mikel, I think, had a big job on his hands to refocus them. Because as we sit here, we are top of the league. And if we beat Chelsea tomorrow, we'll be top of the league. Well, we'll be, we could be level top of the league with Liverpool, but we could be four points clear of City, who don't play their next game until Thursday. So there was a big opportunity, and we seized it. How difficult do you think it was for Mikel and is it in general to, to refocus everybody after a Champions League exit like that and the Villa loss? How, how impressed are you, you know, that the team was sort of able to rally psychologically to, to put the focus and energy into this game to, to deliver the victory in, in a tough place to go and win, even if they were very, very underpowered? Yeah, I think um, I was edgy and nervous about it because... Because, because of the hurt, the grief we went through. You know, the Villa game really hurt as we spoke last week. And then obviously the Bayern game, we could sort of just about accept it. We didn't have enough, you know, enough petrol in the tank. But you know what? It missed opportunity maybe from the first leg. We could just about talk ourselves around. But when it comes down to it, we go into walls. And this game was always a worry anyway. But maybe the Villa game was the one to worry about. You know, and um, But as soon as Havertz had that first volley in the first minute or so, my, I just settled down. You know, and um, and I was yeah. quite pleased to see the team that was picked. Um, that it was a serious team because I've not I stayed away from this rotation chat earlier. And so, because you, if you're playing fifty five games a season and you come to the last five, everyone's shouting, "We need to rotate." No, nah, mate. The manager just goes to the players and says, "I need five more games from you, so you get what yeah. you deserve for the last ten months." That's a conversation that generally happens. And Scott sort of alluded to something online. I thought he was very, very intelligent. 
you know, it wasn't so long ago we were bemoaning, and I'm going to paraphrase what Scott said, he got me thinking this way. It wasn't so long ago that we were moaning about our our physios and all the injuries that we've had. and But now all of our key players, touch wood, have been fit for most of the season. And the fact they've rattled up these games is down to us and our good work in the background to make sure these people are honed. Every now and again, we look a bit tired, no doubt about it. But Saka stayed on for the whole game and had his best period of the game probably in the last 15 minutes at the weekend. And so I don't think we're experts. I don't think we understand what goes into selection. I don't think we understand all of the nuance around selection. The game plan, how you want to start games, how you want to end games. What I do know, Elliot, is from talking to people like yourself, managing game state is very important for Arsenal. Very important. Getting that first goal mm. is very important. And so having strong teams to start games seems to be the way we go. Get our goal, then we manage the game thereafter. And I think that's very important to us. When we don't get that first goal, I worry. I genuinely worry. And um, so game state, that drives our selection. And that's what we should be looking at for us going forward. Yeah, I got to be honest. I'm feeling a little bit attacked or or at least a little <laughs> infringed upon. Because it seems like everybody else has stolen my whiskers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm supposed to be the worrier. Everybody else is worried about a thing I'm not worried about in the sense that this, this is where I think sort of correlation and causation gets deeply misunderstood. People, the fact that we have so many more players who have played a lot of minutes than City is actually one of the reasons we're competing for here. the title. Thank because you, it Elliot. means our best players are fit. And in fact, credit to Adam Ray Vogue on Twitter for this factoid, because I think this is relevant. In Liverpool's title winning season, they had six players with more minutes than City's most used player. We currently have six players with more minutes than City's most used player. Yeah. Now, again, that's just... Uh, those things are associated doesn't mean that they are going to lead to the same outcome, which was Liverpool running away with the league in that season. I'm already Too thinking late. it. <laughs> I am as well. But like, it, some people see it as a bug. It's a feature. When you go into any season, one of the first criteria for being able to have the season you hope you're going to have is that your key players are fit and play a lot. If Bakayo Saka had 1,500 minutes this season, we would not be competing for the title. Same with Saliba. Right? right. We saw it last season. We saw it last season. And so, well, I, I am not trying to dismiss a question about rotation. I'm not trying to dismiss the need for a deeper squad. You're always trying to make your squad better. You're always trying to use your squad better. And we have maybe a few too many players, Clive, that we have recommitted to that the manager simply does not trust when the chips are down. Eddie Anketi has played about 114 minutes in the Premier League since the new year. Reese Nelson and Smith Rowe, this blew my mind, have played fewer minutes in the Premier League this season than Thomas Party. That seems impossible. Mm. And yet it's true. And so well, I do think that there is hold you work to do I on hold the squad. You. Yeah, please, please. Mm. I hold you on that thought. There's just a couple of us here today. I think I'm I'm absolutely fine with us recommitting to these guys because they become saleable assets. If we don't recommit, we're, we, are, we are absolutely dumb letting go academy homegrown graduates where everything we book is pure profit. We're absolutely dumb if we don't control that story. We have to control that story to allow us to reinvest in the squad going forward because we've done a lot of very good things in the last three to four years, but selling well isn't one of them. But we've mm. improved all our contract renewals, and now this is the year to see what we can sell. The loan army coming back, players that have had some minutes, not enough maybe for, for some people, had enough minutes to, to make sure they're still relevant and people know their names. And so I think this is a chance to get some money back and really invest in this squad to allow maybe a higher level of quality around these players in a game that's forever changing, with tournaments growing, Euros coming up in the summer, all of our favourite players that are, are jogging around now, they're going off for their countries in the summer. It just makes you wonder how much time we're going to get. You know, we got a game in LA, was it late July? I wonder how many of these yep. players are going to be there, Elliot. You know, I just wonder. <laughs> it could be crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting. I mean, so look, ultimately, our best players are available to be picked, and we're picking them, and that's what good teams do. They keep picking mm -hmm. their best players. I think this this game felt like one where 
I don't know that wolves ever scared me particularly, but what scared me is just that we wouldn't have the energy in our legs to punish them. This was a weak wolves team. Let's be honest. The, the team they put out there probably gets relegated if that's the team they have to put out all season long. Okay. It's not a good one, but you still have to go and do the job. Um, and I think what we saw in this game is what makes us a little bit different than Liverpool, for example, which is we just have the ability to close out the light to the opposition and give them nothing. And when you do that, one moment, or in this case, two moments of execution are enough to give you the win. They had five shots in this game total. I believe that's right. Yeah, five shots. And they had 0.1 expected goals. Um, so we did close out the light a bit. Let's do this. Instead of going through the moments in the game, because there, there were some interesting moments, I think there are a few positions and areas that are up for debate and that are interesting. And, you know, the one that does seem to be generating the most conversation right now is the left back position. And I think it's because we largely feel really good about 10 of the 11 players we start with. And that 11th player, that left back, is a debate. I think we'd like Tomiyasu to be fit because I think he gives us comfort, a little bit of ball playing, a, a, a lot of defensive solidity. I think we'd like Timber to be playing, although at this point, I think we really have to accept what I've been trying to say for months and months and months, which is he's coming back next season. And we're going to have to see what he is when he comes back because we've only had a limited yeah. viewpoint. So it's it's Zinchenko and Kivior. I have no problem with anyone that prefers Kivior or Zinchenko. I think both players are flawed in their own ways. I think Kivior is a center back, learning left back and you know playing it to the best of his ability with limitations and strength. And I think Zinchenko is a guy who... I think probably is a little bit better, frankly, but at 60 to 70 minutes just seems to fall apart and starts making all kinds of mental mistakes uh, yeah. and plays the game in a different way that might create a little more vulnerability in our overall structure. So it's a tough one, but Wolves had one chance in this game that I regard as a chance, and it did come down Kibior's side when he was beaten pretty poorly in a duel uh, down, down the touchline. I do think that Wolves tried to target that side. Um, I definitely think he had a better second half than first half and grew into the game. But overall, what, what's your take on his performance in that position generally? See, I knew that question was coming. So being a good podcaster, I watched the first half today uh, just with my eyes on Kivio. And um, what I will say is um, he started the game really well, actually, crossing the first minute that that led to Havertz's volley, another cross later in the half, and he was running downhill. Then there was one long clearance from Saar, and he got underneath it. Then he got robbed from behind with a about to switch play and someone nicked it from behind. And then he did he did the thing with the ball hit him in the face and he ran. Jal Gomez, who's a very good player, by the way. I'm trying to learn about him. I did see a soft arsehole link to him. I didn't know what he is. I'm still going to learn and see if he's good because he looked good to me. He nicked off him and great shot, great save. Right. So then after that, he settled. Nothing to see here. And you're absolutely right. All of Sars, well, first four kicks went straight to that left-hand side. And whether you say he's targeted him, but I'll give you another scenario, Elliot. If, because I watched when he went to our right-hand side, in the last, as soon as we break, the, as soon as we get the ball back on our right-hand side, we get shots. So everyone knows our right side is elite. Our left side takes a bit more time to build. And so mm. go to our left, because then whatever happens, we want to switch the point of attack to our right. And that gives the opposition time to organize. If they lose the ball around Ben White, Saliba, Odegaard space, you got a problem, mate. Transition on that side, Saka runs in behind, it's a shot or a cross. Right? So so going left is not always about Kivio. Because if Sinchenko was there, I would go left as well. Because you keep it away from our right hand side. Absolutely you do. So the progression and development of our team is developed that left hand side. My my thing about Kivio is I think it's nomenclature that people have used. You use the word unusable. And I didn't agree with that. I think he's usable. Uh, I did? I, when, when did I say <laughs> he was so, unusable? Look, I, I, pods, pods back. Pods back, right? So, okay. um, and It must have been an instant reaction. That's it. That feels yeah, very yeah, much yeah. more like an instant reaction <laughs> comment from, and I think, <laughs> um, And I think people have rallied against that because I think he is usable. I don't think he's the answer. You know, I don't think he's the answer. But I think, you know, man, Gary Neville's got eight league championships in his back pocket and he wouldn't have any of them without Wes Brown. Do you see what mm. I mean? And John O'Shea. You need these squad players that come into your group to allow you to 
recover people from injury who are touch better, like Tommy Asu, for example, and Zinchenko, potentially. When Zinchenko plays, and we're not playing with four defenders, we're playing with three. So it's a different game model. And trust me, if we go 1-0 down to Chelsea tomorrow, on Tuesday, as, as we're talking on Monday, we go 1-0 down to Chelsea tomorrow, I'll be looking at Zinchenko to come on. Because we need to get people mm. further forward to take control of that game, like it against Bayern. So I think we have a problem in that position. But it's not massive. It's not massive. Not now we've got people coming back. For example, this week, we got Spurs at the weekend. They have Brendan Johnson plays on the right-hand side. And he was he was clocked as one of the fastest two players in the Premier League last season. So I'm yep. thinking, you know what? I really want Tommy Hassi back for that game. He's a bit sharper, a bit quicker, a bit more experienced. Right? So, but Kivior absolutely can play against Wolves and absolutely can probably play against Chelsea tomorrow, a part in the game if we need him to. So for me, if I misquoted you, apologies, Elliot. Very usable. A squad player. It sounds squad... like the kind of thing I'd say in the wake of a game on the instant reaction. I just don't want, no. I don't want to stand up for it because it's certainly yeah. not my perception no, it's okay. overall. It's okay. yeah. Because you're not the only one that thinks that, right? So Paul, Paul's <clears> got <throat> concerns as well, right? But it's okay to have these concerns. But the, the language around it is important because people then think um, you've got, we've got an agenda. You know it's like we're us guys where we say the wrong things, etc. So basically, for me, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. very usable in certain scenarios. In other scenarios, I get nervous. But he's a squad player on squad player money, development money. He's not a player we've taken from Man City that we want to take us over the line. You know, and for me, when I look at the squad, I look at the more experienced people on good money that we are seeing as primary players to take us to the next level. That's the stuff that really concerns me. The young players, I I don't worry about them. The players that don't Mm. have experience, they're on 55 grand a week. I don't worry about them. You know, the more the fact we can use them is really important. We brought in a centre back last year when Stephen went out. It didn't work out, did it? Cedric, maybe, maybe he's a bit unusable. You know, that's the, that's the, that's the phrase. And I think we just need to recognise this player is absolutely critical to us. We're not for ninety minutes of every game, but he allows us to get to where we need to get to. And I think, you know, very very interesting positioning that we do have a weakness there. And I am looking at left backs on my YouTube's mate, but I do think this player is is good enough to get us where we need to get to for this season. Yeah, I I think there's a big point being missed here too. A couple seasons ago, Kieran Tierney would be injured at the end of seasons, and Granite Shack have finished seasons playing left back. Yeah, good point. We have four left backs we can use in the Premier League now. Mm. That's a very big advantage because you could make an argument that if the if they were all fit. Timber might be choice one. Tommy might be choice two. And then somewhere you have Zinchenko and Kivior as choice three and four. Find me a club with that quality at choice three and four at any position. Yeah. So you want me to praise Kivior, I'll praise him for this. Whether he's our third choice or our fourth choice left back, that's for you to decide. That's an incredible level to be at for a third or fourth choice option. In, mm. in this kind of squad. And he is a converted center back. And so I give him absolute credit for that. This has never been for me a question of, Kivior stinks and Zinchenko's great or vice versa. It's a question for me of right now, who's who gives us a little more? You know, I have seen Zinchenko start games for an Arsenal that was on a 100-point pace for half a season last season. I've seen him play for City. I'm more familiar with him in his game, and so maybe I'm more comfortable with that. Yeah. Whereas Kivior, I'm still learning about this player, and I'm seeing you know, some of the cracks. And by the way, some, you know, there's still some scars, I'll admit, from last season, the falling down in the box and not getting up in the Brighton game, you know, the when he came on at Anfield, you know, granted that was at center back. I'm not killing the guy. We, we just all have our comfort level. I know that Zinchenko makes a lot of people nervous, where I think there's a big difference. And here's what I think creeps into the evaluation, rightly or wrongly, by the way, I don't mean wrongly. Mentality. There are things in Zinchenko's game belie a mentality that people don't regard as serious enough or focused enough on winning and on defending. Kicking the ball out for a player who was injured is a good thing to do, a sporting thing to do. But I also understand why there's a feeling that you need the dark arts, you need to be ruthless, the, let the referee handle that. Yeah, when he kicked the ball out you know, in Nobody. the Villa game, pe- people booed, right? They did. And then he tried to nutmeg a guy on the edge of our penalty box. People don't like that. It's not serious. It's not serious approach to that situation. It's in his game. It's who he is. It's his personality. And so I understand 
that Zinchenko gives off, I think, a an aura um, in terms of his mindset that I think makes people very uncomfortable. But if you set that aside and you just look at the kind of errors they both make, I think they both have some vulnerability that's actually kind of similar, yeah. but I think Zinchenko maybe has a little more ball progression. So it's 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 definitely a, a almost a personal taste thing. I, I, I As I've said, and we'll say again, I don't think Zinchenko can play beyond the 70-minute mark because I think he, he just, as he f- gets fatigued, what little <laughs> discipline he has completely goes, um, which is not great. But Clive, like, I don't have a problem with either of these guys starting if you look at it in the context of they might be currently third and fourth choice or joint third choice left back, and that's a hell of a decent place to be, really, yeah. if you think about I, it. I think the way I look at it earlier, I just look at the team and what the team needs. And so when I look at the team, I say, okay, I'm more worried about our attack than I am about our defense, if I'm honest with you, because that's where when a, a team that lacks energy, that's where yeah, you're we right. lose it first, right? So, so... And so if, if I'm worried about our attack, I, I think defense first. I don't think inverted left back first. I think, you know mm-hmm. what, I want four totem poles standing there. Because you know what I want, Elliot? I want exactly what we did at the weekend. I want the game state in our control. Now, Keeville could have stepped on his, stepped on his heels, tripped the guy up, penalty, we go one nil down, and that game state discussion disappears. And I'm begging for Zinchenko to come up the bench because we need to get back in control of this game and pin them back. And so I don't go too heavy one way or the other. I just look at what, how I look at football and say, structurally, I like this. I like what we're doing. I do think, you know, Ben White has, has improved so much that he almost embarrasses the other fullback. I mean, the guy's literally our playmaker at the moment on occasions. The amount of balls mm. into the final third he played, crosses he has, his ability to defend. I mean, this guy has gone on a level... And I can remember the start of last season, people saying he is not a fullback. You know, that that was the chat. We've made a mistake. We spent, we've blown 50 million. A year and a half, 18 months later, here we are. And for me, he has no peer in the Premier League. You know, maybe Trent, the way he does it, that's it. You know, and I think he's that good. So anything on the other side is going to look not quite as good. But you can see what we need to, what we need to have, you know. And so... There are development points in, in Kivio's game that I think just around aggression. He did some great front footy stuff in this game, got overexcited a couple of times. But I I love seeing a player develop. So I'm 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 that sort of person anyway. When I see this, I think, oh, mm. next time you can do this, you can do that. So that comes naturally to me to give people time. When I see Chinchenko play, excuse me, <laughs> I love how he controls the game. Particularly at a base with Thomas Party, when Thomas Party likes the right hand side of the pitch. With Declan Rice, I'm not quite sure of the mix. Because Declan Rice likes the left side of the pitch. And I've always had this thought about this. You know, he likes the left side of the of the, the double pivot. And so the, the mix has never been quite right for me in that in that area. And when we're in charge of games, mate, you don't ask me to ask him for a centre-back. No chance. I want to see Zinchenko on the ball doing his stuff. But we have them both. We have Tommy Asu. And we can do what we like. And that's the most important thing. And and for me, they're all very usable. In fact, one of them, the youngest one, on the cheapest money, without him, where are we this season? Because the other two yeah. have been significantly yeah. injured. You know, and so we're here now because of the whole group. Now we've got choices to make, which, you know, nice place to be. I think given the cap problems Zinchenko tends to have and given the way he fades in games, I sort of wonder, we're not going to move to our Chelsea preview fully yet, but we're on the topic. And I think this is one of the big, big talking points. Mm. I sort of wonder if Zinchenko was being kept for the Chelsea game and Tommy's being kept maybe for the Spurs game. Exactly. Um, That's that's why I'm. And I would be okay with that approach. The only issue I have is, and this is where it gets tough. The fans were pretty clear how they feel about Zinchenko in the Villa game. They got on his back early. And they boot him off. You know, not everybody. I don't want to. I don't want to say yeah. everybody did that, but there was some of that. And I, I think Zinchenko has shown he's a very emotional guy. Do you worry at all just about the very, very short fuse the fans have with Zinchenko right now, and giving him a start in a very big game at home with that kind of scrutiny? I, I have kind of thought that's how he's going to line up, but you know, I, I that is in my mind. I'm wondering if it's in your mm-hmm. mind at all. It was in my mind, and I, I think 
you know, even though I've got a, a leaning and a bias towards more physical fullbacks can, that control their mm. side and not not number tens playing fullback, shall we say? But I enjoyed it last season, didn't I? When we were on fifty point, hundred point pace, I didn't say much then, did I? You know, so um, I was mm. controlling every single game. So I'm I'm being honest here. Uh, but towards the end of the season, where we lost some stability, I was looking for four centre backs or four defenders and a double pivot because I believe this is the time of year that we're in where you control your life. So I do have less of a, a a liking for that. However, I I do think he the Villa game was unique, Elliot, and I don't know what everyone's still talking about Villa game. There was a lot of nerves around. There was, and Zinchenko is not somebody that calms your nerves naturally. No, he he mm-hmm. plays into the risk. He plays into it, and if someone else was doing the same things, I think they would have just felt the backlash from the nerves that we all felt as we could see the game maybe moving away from us. And it was mm. just it was just the nature of the game. I don't think it's personal. He there was a little bit of grumblings when he came off, but I was there, mate, watching it. And yeah, I went. I haven't seen that for a while at Arsenal, mm-hmm. but I, I threw it away in my mind to be honest. And he's only a good cross or a good pass away from getting back into our into our good books, you know. And to be honest, it wasn't so long ago in the Bayern in the second half in the home game where he had an outstanding half. Things change very quickly in football. Leaving your mind open to improvements and developments is the key as a fan. Because if he has a good moment against Chelsea, that conversation around Villa will look quite embarrassing. You know, so my mind's open to that. If you ask me honestly about him, Elliot, I've said me and T, you and Tim had a conversation a few months ago and I asked the question, do you think we should go another contract with him? And it was a pointed question because I thought we should be talking to him by now and we weren't. The injury record is, is interesting. And I think positionally, if and I've said it before, if I'm him, I'm looking to get myself into midfield permanently. And maybe the next phase of his career will be as a midfielder. You know, and I think he should be looking at that. If Arsenal can't do it for him, he may need to think about his next phase of his career. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes it's not about individuals. It's about the game evolving too. Because if you look a few seasons back, City were conquering everybody with Cancelo at fullback and Liverpool were conquering everybody with Trent Alexander-Arnold at fullback. And now you see Cancelo getting absolutely brutalized at the far post, getting beat to have Barca go out to PSG and getting beat for Barca to lose the, the Classico, right? And you look at... Trent Alexander-Arnold and and Liverpool can't control games defensively when he plays there and he's targeted and Zinchenko's become a bit of a liability for us. Things move and on. you look at what City have tried to do, right, with center backs at, at fullback and defensive fullbacks. Um, you know, not that Walker can't get up the pitch also, but he's sort of a unicorn. Yeah. Um, but, you know, with Ake or Kanji or, who, you know, whoever's playing it at fullback for, for City. And we've done it with Ben White on one side. And um, Liverpool might have had their best run of the season with Trent not even in at fullback. Um, I think wide forwards have just gotten so tricky and so pacey and so good. And teams are really, really putting fullbacks under pressure. They're switching play back post arrivals are really important. And I certainly think Kivior, for example, is better on those back post arrivals than Zinchenko. So the game is changing a little bit too, in terms of what teams are asking their fullbacks to be and to do the physicality of that position. Um, maybe they're realizing, because if you look at like Martinelli and Sacken, who they've struggled against, some of those big fullbacks, the ones you think they just twist into, into the ground, but you know those big bodies are harder to get past. They can physically yeah. bully you, so you wear down over the course of the game. I think the game's changing a little bit, Clive, and that is. that isn't necessarily the fault of those fullbacks who play that way. It's just more about what's needed in that position. Exactly. So protect your half spaces, mate. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Box out your back post. You got to do that. And I think maybe the next development for us is not to invert from fullback, but maybe to invert from centre back. We want to try to get the three at the back because we don't we have redundancy if we have four standing there, right? So on occasion, do we want a centre back to say, I'm gonna go into midfield and we still have our three and we have our sides protected, but we still got a, a chance to get our box in midfield that way. <clears throat> John Stone's the first one to do it. And you can see this happening with Arsenal. There's a player that we're linked to. In Osmande Diamande, I think, from um, Sporting Lisbon. Can play mm-hmm. centre mid, can play right centre back, left centre back, strong lad. I mean, you can see him, someone like him, stepping into midfield. You can see Saliba stepping into midfield if he had to, and Gabriel sweeping. I think the next phase of development and evolution could be just that. You know, Div- it, rather than invert from the sides when if you switch point attack, you're, you're sort of stretched invert from the middle 
We switch point attack, you're still in position, and then you can recover inside to your zone 14 spaces. It makes a lot of sense tactically, and a lot of sense risk-wise. So maybe that's the next phase for us. Yeah, and it, I, it, it is still interesting to me that we we think about this so much because we've been excellent defensively. And I do think attack is a space where we need to level up. I mean, if you look at our expected goals allowed, we're dominantly best in the league. We've conceded the mm -hmm. fewest goals in the league as well. If you look at our expected goals for, despite our goal tally looking good, once again, we're massively overperforming XG. And that is a high wire act that you don't want to have to depend on as much as we've depended on it the last two seasons. Um, this was a weird game, by the way, in the sense that we had, was it 24 shots? Does it feel like a game where we had 24 shots? You know, it didn't feel like we were battering them, but then you look at it and I mean, it's crazy. I think, I mean, am I right in saying that like they blocked a ton of shots in this game? Um, yeah, they did. FBRF is saying, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I was going to say, it shows you how nervous we all were because trust me, I remember every single jewel that we lost in, in our defensive third, <laughs> every single, every single header. I remember every single one that we lost. We can't remember the 24 shots, can we? <laughs> we can't remember them. They, right? they blocked nine <laughs> shots, Clive. So nine blocked shots. That that feels like a lot. I mean, maybe it's not. I don't know. They also restrict us to things like Rice took a bunch at the top of the box. They did a good job getting compact in central spaces when we, you know, attack. So, but but we did enough. Look, I think we can do some quick hits on some players in this game that are interesting. You know, Trissard is certainly one I want to talk about. Kai Havertz played left eight again, which I know people don't, Love, um, you know, and haven't been through. I'd love to Jesus. talk about the attack, Elliot, because I've got some thoughts. Yeah, yeah. So, we, so uh, let's do this. Let me, let me do some ad reads because I'm people are hankering for those right now. I can feel people <laughs> saying enough already. Get to the ad reads. So let me do those, and then we'll uh, we'll do some quick hits on that and, and turn our attention to Chelsea. So, first things first, uh, we want to let you know that whether you're a world class athlete or a podcaster like Clive, which is also a world class athlete, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well being and proper recovery for top notch performance. It's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of the Arsenal Vision Podcast. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by the Energy Enhancement System or EE System. It's because there's two E's and then they turned it. You, you get the idea. If you haven't heard the EE system yet, you want to listen up. It is a technology that promotes wellness, deep relaxation, rejuvenation, whether you're here in the US or hundreds of other locations around the globe. Access to a center is easy and affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? You should be. Go to unifiedhealing.com slash arsenal vision to learn more and find a center near you. That's unified, U N I F Y D, healing.com slash arsenal vision. No material testimonials in the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of physician or your other qualified healthcare provider with any question you may have regarding medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including the system. Okay, disclaimer done. Now, this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. See, we, we, we healed your body. Now we're going to heal your mind. BetterHelp isn't online therapy. It's just therapy. I tell the story of my mom because I think it's a perfect example. My mom is 82. She doesn't drive anymore. She'd done therapy her whole life. It's been really helpful for her. She's someone who had uh, challenges in her in her upbringing and childhood that she's worked through her whole life. And I think therapy has been a really, really helpful process for her. But at 82 and without driving, it's something that she hasn't really uh, been able to continue with and uh, until I was able to recommend better help. And so I think there are a lot of people out there that want to do therapy, but for one reason or another, going to an office, finding a therapist, going and meeting with them, driving home, or if you can't even drive you can't get access. It's a critical part of health. It's, we shouldn't think about it as something you do when you're in crisis. We should think of it as something you do to help you find and connect to your happiness. And right now, I think a lot of us could use that because our mental health is challenged more than ever by uh, social dynamics online. So give it a try. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash vision today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash vision. And last but not least, the one that most people ask me about of all the things we get uh, um, sponsored on this podcast, and that's NordVPN. When I was on my vacation, which I did not want to be on, let's be clear about that, I wanted to be watching Arsenal. The only reason I was able to watch the Bayern Munich tie, the only reason I was able to watch the Villa game, which now that I think about it, I wish I hadn't, was because of NordVPN, because I was able to VPN back and watch Paramount Plus, VPN back and watch Peacock. And you can VPN and sign up for services in other countries where they're less expensive. How about that? That's crazy, right? There's a little life hack. You can sign up, you know, in the UK and watch Match of the Day. NordVPN is one-click app on your computer, on your phone. Boom, you can browse wherever you want to browse. It also has threat protection, so it can remove um, all the different various threats that you may have uh, getting onto your computer if you are watching on dodgy streams. Not that anybody would be doing that, but if you are. So, 
NordVPN is here, okay, to get you a huge discount off your NordVPN plan. That's right. A huge, huge, it's absolutely huge, huge discount off your NordVPN plan, okay? It's nordvpn.com slash arsenalvision. You get the Nord plan plus four months for free, and it's completely risk-free with 30-day money-back guarantee. Get your exclusive NordVPN deal, nordvpn.com slash arsenalvision. That's nordvpn.com slash arsenalvision. Try it now with a free 30-day money-back guarantee. Glad. It's enough of that. Indeed. Now, okay. The attack. Kai at eight is the thing Mikel wanted to do at the start of the season. Kai at nine is what he became over the course of the season. But I think it was always premature to believe that we would not see Kai at eight again. We did see it in this game with Jesus up front, Trissard on the left. It's a lot of things that people maybe expected we'd move past. Martinelli not started. Trissard preferred. Kai preferred it at nine. Jorginho not starting. So it's it's a bit of a switch up. Um, and it's Jesus' hard work in the box that leads to the goal for Trissard that's beautifully taken. Um, what do you think of the attack right now? I think, as crazy as it sounds, here we are in April, and I think we're still searching a little bit. We're still searching just a little bit for the click, you know? <laughs> you and your attacking click. I do like I the hope, click. I hope forever we're searching uh, because mm. we need to keep changing our face, right? We need to keep changing it, and that's because we, as soon as we do something for five games in a row, someone will find a way to stop it. So we've got to change it again, and that's it. So we've got to get comfortable with that. And so... I thought when we started the game, I didn't know where people were playing. You know, Chosar was going centre forward, Havertz is spinning into the into Saka's channel. Then he went centre forward, Jesus tucked into midfield with if Havertz got robbed as a higher up player. And I and I really quite like the relationship between them all. Um and we just gotta to move towards that. If you look at the, the players that we had on the pitch, I thought we had our more experienced attackers on the pitch to try to deliver in a game where everything was on the line, shall we say? You know, lose this game, then then the bottles will be coming out against us, and all the narratives would, would reappear. So I quite liked it, but as the game went on, and again, it's maybe my own biases. I thought Havertz's responsibility and availability is quite unique, and I've grown comfortable with it. I've grown comfortable with his work rate and effort. He's pressing from the front. We sort of used him slightly behind Jesus in sort of the rice role to press him behind there. And he read that beautifully and got some turnovers. It didn't quite lead to attacks. I, I just think he's our, he's our premier forward that I feel comfortable with. And it's made me think about the summer slightly differently. It's almost like a backfill for him as a centre forward rather than going big in a centre forward. That gives a lot of what he has. Because I think the real win is back to what we said earlier. It's in the half spaces. It's in those wide areas, attacking mids and wide areas. That's where the goals come from now. People start out wide and leave those positions and come inside. We spent five years watching Salah and Mane, didn't we? They didn't play a centre four, did they? Look at their goal records, etc. So I think that's where I'd like to see us go. So, Jesus, I know he's your boy, etc. But I find myself not, although I thought he had a decent game and he emptied his soul for the amount of time he was on the pitch, I find myself looking for more certainty about what he's going to do next. Do you know? Mm. I just find myself almost like getting, and by the way, I need a slap here if I'm wrong. I find myself almost getting angry by not knowing what he's going to do. I, not, he doesn't look like himself to me, by the way. Yeah. He, I, mm. I, 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 you know, when you like a player, you tend to give them excuses, right? So I realize me saying maybe there's still fluid on that knee or he's just not back all the way back is is me protecting a player I like and maybe I wouldn't protect other players in that way. So I, I want to be cautious of that bias, but mm. I will confess that I don't see the effervescent, vibrant player that arrived a year ago and had so much um, dynamism in the way he attacked the box and and got on the end of chances and created space in tight areas. He did create the opening goal with his work in the box, and he's, yeah, his yeah, work yeah. rate and his his battling continues to be there. But the yeah. the level of skill and technique that we're used to seeing from him does not does not look like yeah. him to me right now. Yeah. So you know, and when you when you watch the game, you're nervous as hell. The players that you're not quite, you know, they're not quite informed. You get edgy for them, you know. So mm. you know, if, you know, if Kivio's got a ball bouncing around him, I'm saying, go on, knock it, knock it, quick, quick, quick. Okay, that's good. We're okay. I mean, it's natural. We're fans, right? We support the players. But now and again, we know when someone's not tipped up for a five-minute period, which which happens, right? And they fight for it, come out the other side. 
So when the ball goes into Jesus, I, I don't mind that he's unpredictable. But if he's unpredictable and, t- and the teammate's not reading him, then he's, he's unpredictable, not good. If he's unpredictable slowing down the, the attack, then that's not good. So in my mind, I say, yeah, I want you to be unpredictable, but maybe be unpredictable off the sides. When the defender doesn't know what you're going to do, it's a one-on-one duel and you can kill him from there. You know, when my when the centre forward has the ball, I want to know he's going to roll in and lay it. I want to know he's going to spin down the sides and hold it. I want to know that he can physically win a, the first phase ball in the air. I just want a little bit more certainty. Because if I can see it with my eyes, then the players can run off him in a, in a, in a more cohesive way. So that's just a period that we're going through. When Jesus first arrived at it, he could do what he liked. He could spin left, he could spin right. And wherever he went, Martinelli went back to where he left. Do you know what I mean? And the, the two of them were working together. So he could do what he liked. He'd go wide space, it didn't matter. Martinelli popped in centre forward and we were good. Those relationships haven't had as much enough time to solidify this year. So I'm questioning it a little bit more. But we are talking first world problems here, aren't we? We've just about scored the most goals in the league and conceded the least. And he's out there and he's and he's playing 70 minutes a game now. So he's he's only around the corner for maybe finding his form. And I know you've mm. only got five games to go, but we only need one big moment at the right time. And life's good, right? So you've just got to stay with him. Yeah. <clears throat> so one of the players that I think is so interesting to analyze, Clive, because he's he's unique to our team in a certain way is Leander Trossard, right? I think he takes the goal brilliantly. I think he means it, by the way. It's a brilliant finish. 45th minute, I think. The perfect time to score. I think one of the biggest things that's changed between the Villa game and, and this Wolves game to some extent versus when we were really red hot. When we were red hot, we were getting that early early goal. And when Arsenal get a lead, boy, are we something. You know, I mean, I, I know we've thrown a couple of them away earlier in the season, but since the new year, getting early leads has been the key to making games very comfortable Absolutely. for us. Because teams try to come out, and once they try to come out, like they're, they're dead. I think the Villa game is a great example. We should have been ahead a couple of different times. Yeah, I think it was a very good first half, but you could see us fade a little bit in the second half. And by the very end, it was it was a little too open, and there were there was a chance, and Villa took it, and that was that. In the Wolves game, you know, I saw us dominating. I didn't see a goal coming necessarily, if I'm honest. And then mm-hmm. Trissard pulls that out after great work from Jesus. I find myself when Trissard starts from the left, frustrated by him and not seeing the the clean technique and the execution I'd like, but the guy just has a knack for finding the back of the net and you cannot underestimate the importance of that skill. Um, You know, the Porto tie, this game, so many goals that he scored that aren't just well-taken goals, but important goals. Um, I feel like, did did he score against Byron? Am I? Uh, Yes, second goal against Byron. Second goal against Byron too. Yeah, I mean, lovely finish again, right? Um, a, A good chance, but a lovely finish. How do you evaluate this kind of player? A player who can look a little loose, maybe not completely at the level until he's in front of goal and all of a sudden he's, he's scored you a critical goal. Yeah, it's back to it's back to partnerships and relationships again, Elliot. And so what I like about him is, is that he's got the personality to say, I'm coming in, I'm going to the center, center forward position. I'm going to go in. I'm going to this, the penalty spot. I'm going in because I know that's where the ball's going to land. If it doesn't come to me first phase, I'm going to move out second phase, get, get it then. He's a proper adult, right? So he doesn't he doesn't mind where he goes. He knows where the he knows where the action is if he goes there. So I'll give you an example, just a simple example. So we play four at the back at the moment and we sort of cradle the team with our fullbacks. They White's a bit more, you know, attacking, a touch more than say Kivo in this game. But those two fullbacks now have got everything inside of them when they have the ball. Right? So when Sinchenko plays. Trossard now has to be on the outside of him. So the outside line. Because Sinchenko inverts, he has to be on the outside line. I just think the partnership is Sinchenko and Martinelli. Because Martinelli is happy on the outside line. It's Kivior and Trossard, if you see what I mean. Because Trossard mm. will go on the inside. Now then, and Trossard becomes a goal threat. So you can see the selection there. People talk about selection. They need to understand, try to work it out and understand mm. it. I don't. I'm learning all the time. But you can see, you can see why that works, can't you? You know... If you have an inverted fullback on the left-hand side and a trossard, we're now wondering where our width is coming from on that side. You know? And so so that's that's the way it goes. And I want trossard near that box, mate, because I trust him to hit laces on both feet. I trust him to do it. And when the pressure's at its hottest, you, you soon work out who you trust. You work it out real quick. At the moment, yeah. Martinelli might be the might be the sharper winger. At this moment in time, Elliot, I do not trust him to finish. 
have got no, no recent track record. You know, it's yeah. a terrible thing to say, but it's true, isn't it? That's how you no, make the decisions, right? Yeah, it's not wrong. You know, it's, it's, and, yeah. and it's just no but, track record, so we go from there. Isn't this a thing that fans stress about, but actually good teams need to have, right? Which is, we love Martinelli, and we think he's quite good, and he might go on to be fantastic for us next season. At the moment, his form isn't at the top, top, top. And you know what? We've got a Leandro Trissard. Um, you know, I don't think... Pep was legendary to fantasy Premier League players for driving them nuts by picking attackers that they weren't expecting and leaving an attacker that you would in your fantasy lineup on the bench because they had those options, you yeah. know? Um, and I think if you want to be a team at this level, you have to be able to say, you know what? My left winger is not in the absolute, you know, roaringest of form. So I'm going to pick my other left winger who can't stop finding the back of the net. That's a good yep. problem to have. We tend to see it as a bad problem because we're like, oh no, Martinelli's not in top form. Players sometimes aren't in top form. And when you have another guy who finds the back of the net every game, that's a good thing. It's not a problem. You know? Exactly that. And we got to accept it as as watchers. And, you know, we're playing Spurs at the weekend earlier. And the Spurs defend in a in a two, three, right? So and the two in midfield the three two fullbacks in midfield don't want to run backwards. I know mm. which left side do I want to play that Spurs game. Yep. I want it to be Martinelli. I want it to be yep. him. Did you see what Newcastle did to them with with Gordon and, and Harvey Barnes and Isaac? They ran mm -hmm. in, ran in, ran in. I want Martinelli and Saka starting that game with Havertz starting that game. I want the runners starting that game, not the people going to feet. They can get robbed. And then we, we're on the transition. I want them running backwards continuously. And so if Martinelli's, if he's kept away in a, in a, in cotton wool until they're not saying he should be, but you see what I mean? I want him to play that game because the game state will suit him. If anything, the bigger problem is that we don't have a Trissard on the right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we have to just keep flogging Saka. There's a couple other performances I want to touch on in sort of a quick hit section here, if we can. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Cause there's, there's a little bit more on this bone. One is David Raya. I think yeah. recently both Gabriel and Saliba have looked a little nervier and less comfortable than I'm used to seeing them. Yep. Saliba in particular just seems like he's, a little bit nervier. Um, I, I think in general, he just struggles with long straight balls a bit. You know, his heading is no always accurate. He doesn't always judge mm -hmm. the flight of the ball as well as he could, but he's looked a little nervier. And I think Javid Raya has just been a nice, calm influence for the most part. Um, yeah. In this game, they went to Raya a lot. He obviously is the big, big save. I mean, there's no world where Arsenal don't deserve to beat Wolves in this game. Yeah. But that's not how football works. And that one moment... If he doesn't get a fingertip to that, Wolves are ahead and they have something to protect and we're tired and it it becomes a very different type of game. So um, I, I think Raya has been good. I think he looked assured. I think he gives comfort to Gabriel and Saliba who look like they kind of need it right now. So just a quick thought on Raya's performance and big save and cool uh, and collected with his feet. Yeah, I thought I thought it was really good. There's one chip free kick into the box here that when he got up, took the catch, and need Lamina into in his back, and he was down injured for a while. And I love mm -hmm. that. Don't chip, don't chip the ball into my box, mate. You're going to get this. You know I mean, mm -hmm. it's very important that you send that message back. I thought um, there was there were. But you know what? Can I, can I stop you on that? Yeah, because we talked about that uh, in Chicago when it happened. He understands the moment because he didn't go through Lamina. He didn't like take him out and give the referee a decision to make. There's nothing. Yeah. In it. He's protecting himself, but he doesn't do it in a way that creates a decision for the referee. I thought it was really yeah. Um, savvy. Yeah. Yeah, he won it, caught, caught the ball, and whatever happens thereafter, it's down to, I'm sorry, mate, you got to get out of the way. And so he, I thought he was good. There was one good uh, movement by Wolves with Doyle and Gomez on the right-hand side, and basically Cross came in, and he read it. He realized where he was on the stretch, but it's good. Could we put pressure on the cross? So the one place he could go, and he read it and then kept it and slowed it down. I thought it was really good. Distribution across the area, one game, one point made me a bit nervy. I thought it was really good because, Elliot, I'll be straight with you, you know my views. I thought he was really running into form. But he found the buying game a little bit big. You know, he was a bit nervous yeah. in that home game. Yeah. And it un it unsettled me and unsettled us. And we, we conceded in that period. And for me, I felt we lost a tie in that period. <clears throat> and that's an experience. And how can I, even though he's 28, he's never been there before. You know, we're not, we're not sure how we're going to react until that moment comes, you know? And, um, and so, yeah, so I thought his recovery and poise was really good. I, it's very difficult to say he needs to talk more, but I sometimes feel 
he needs to talk more, <laughs> you know, and really take charge verbally. But I, they might be talking all the time, and I just can't see it or hear it. So, um, but yeah, I really liked his um performance, and we both went for him, didn't we? Stock rising separately, and yeah. um, so that tells you there was something that he was giving off that we that we both liked. Sometimes you have to have <clears throat> the combination of quality, but also just like heart. I don't know any other way to say it. Commitment to the cause. And Declan Rice really allied those two things in this game. I mean, I think he he had quality in the game. I think he was a little unlucky with a couple of his shots. He had the, I want to say, side foot from the top of the box. It just went yeah. wide of the post. But Clive, the way he was running around in the last 10 minutes when you could tell he was absolutely gassed, but he would not lose a duel. He would not let a loose ball go. He he showed a lot of leadership in this game. He and Odegaard both in the way they finished it. I don't yeah. think it was Odegaard's best game in the first half, but he wins mm-hmm. us the game. Yeah, you know, or at least me. There is no better goal. I mean, there are better goals, but one of the best goals in football is the "I'm biting my fingernails off" that we hold on to the lead, and then you get the second goal to make it safe, so yeah. you can have a nice, easy ride. like that. That goal feels great. It's like the the um, Jesus goal against United in the home game, uh, yeah. where he puts Dallow on his ass. Those goals, those goals are just great. Rice and Odegaard, you know, I think such a critical part of our spine and how we play, but Rice in this game was fantastic. And the way he finished it, even though he was clearly gassed, showed a lot of leadership and a lot of heart. Yeah, I thought a few of our players stepped up in the last phase of the game. Again, mm. the changes from the bench made us maybe a bit stronger. You know, when you play all your cards, like against Villa, the changes made us a bit weaker, shall we say? And we weren't able to push the game in the last quarter. In this game, I thought we pushed it big time. We pushed it and we... we we stayed, we stayed energetic. Um, you know, party came on and just gave us a little bit of presence in there and people knew where they would be. They knew the ball was going to come through. We chipped the ball long where we needed to. We clipped it line where we needed to. We played in the right areas. And we, and when Declan writes the ball drops to him, sometimes he can pass his way out of trouble, but sometimes he just runs his way out of trouble. So he, he beats the press by running it out. You know, and mm. I think it's an interesting one. You know, we've had this conversation before and I had it with my son as well. Do we want to make him a Steven Gerrard, Declan Rice? Is that what we want him to be? And, you know, and I started off thinking that. I thought he was a Shaka replacement, and that's where he's going to be. And then you see him play six, and I know he needs to be there. Maybe I shouldn't be putting him in a box, but it is important that we understand this because our next signing needs to be a true partner. What's he going to be? Is he going to be like him, a 6 8? Or is he going to be a ball playing player, a passer first that gets on the ball? And maybe he and he bodyguards. I don't know. I I change my mind all the time, but it's, it's difficult to watch him play like he did the weekend and not think we'd be misusing you if we got you standing in front of two centre backs. You know, so maybe you just got to create those options, Elliot. But yeah, I thought he was excellent on the day. Really good. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Um, special player, really special player. I just, I think this game was one where you get your nose in front and you hold on to it. And he was a critical part of us being able to do that. Do you, do you feel that the manager is going through a crisis of confidence in his bench a little bit and his subs, you know, he, he waited to make them. He didn't make as many as he could, obviously. Um, we got the result and that's all that matters. But do you have a concern that at this time he's, this is a natural time of the season to shorten your bench, so to speak. You know what I mean? It's a yeah. natural time of the season to restrict the number of players you use because you, you you're simply trying to get over the line at this point. But when you still have Chelsea and you go to Spurs and you still have to go to United and you're still playing every three days, you also have to balance that against energy levels. Would you like to have seen him go earlier to the bench and go deeper into the bench? I think against Chelsea, we're going to see a little bit more bench usage because the turnaround is really, really quick. Mm-hmm. After this game on Tuesday, we've got till Sunday for Spurs. I think we have a clean week. So this is the this is the risky one if you see. What I mean, they're, they're they're all risky. This is the risky one from an energy point of view. Where where are we going to be? We're at home though, right? Against Chelsea, and the energy will come mm-hmm. from people watching in the stands and going to lift us again. Controlling gain state is very important to his team. We don't want to give a young Chelsea team something to hold on to because they will try their best to do it just for fun. You know, they've literally got nothing else to play for apart from bloodying Arsenal's nose. But just for fun, as we sit here today, Cole Palmer potentially was sick, missed training, may not be playing in the game. Um, they have a young team that had a quite a big disappointment, two disappointments at Wembley this season. Let's see where they are, right? See what they have to play for. Um, for us, I just think we just got to find it again. 
we got to find it with the smart rotations on those positions which we know we're going to rotate. But make sure we can react from the bench, whether it be offensively or defensively. And we have most of our players super fit now, more max fit than they were two, three weeks ago. Right? When it comes to the players that we like the Smith Rose, your Vieiras and your Nelsons and your Eddies, I'm afraid they're game state players now. If we're ahead, we need to get people out. That's that type of thing. But the core people that we want to win, win us the games, we know who they are. You know, we know who they are. And I think that's the way it's going to stay for the next few games. We've got some big, exciting games to come. And, yeah, we're going to find out about this group, right? But, they, you know, I'm a lot happier today than I was after the Bayern game, that's for sure. little frustrated by Bernardo Silva because he denied us the chance to have Chelsea go 120 minutes, um, which would have been nice. But it is what it is. You want to take a stab at... And by the way, if they do miss Cole Palmer, and I... I sort of doubt that they'll miss him, but if they yeah. miss him, that's huge because obviously you want to attack down our left-hand side. I don't care if it's if it's Zinchenko or Kivior. There's a vulnerability there. If it's Tomiyasu, I'll feel a lot better, um, but that's another story. Meanwhile, Spurs, we should mention, sitting and relaxing, soaking up their 4-0 loss to Newcastle for 15 days before they play us. So they will be fresh, whether yeah. that will mean that they're rusty or who knows, we'll have to see this time for discussing that. After the Chelsea game, this is the week, though, right, Clive? I mean, Chelsea at home, Spurs away. It it feels like this is the the pivotal moment. Um, you want to take a swing at how you would line up for Chelsea? Yeah, Chelsea they they tilt right, you know, like we tilt right in our, in our attack, and um, so they they go into the Cole Palmer Madueke side, go on that side. Maro Gusto's a nice overlapping fullback, good player, one of the players that has done well for them. And they do well. They've got Nicholas Jackson, who's quite sprinty on the transition. So, yeah, they're not a bad team. And, they're, and you know, Elliot, they're a better team data-wise than they are maybe positionally, you know. And um, so they have got that potential to do to do some damage. But their back line is, is shocking, mate. And that's where we have to play. They, they score a lot, yeah. but they concede a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, they, they give a lot of <laughs> Yeah, yeah honestly, honestly, it's shocking. So we have to play there. We have to play there. So what teams are doing now, they're trying to break our press by splitting the centre-backs. We've all seen that on TV now. Break our press. Or they go long to try to get the territory and, and get us to play out. So everyone's doing the same thing. Picking on either Bayern went to, sorry, Villa went to Ben White, you know, with Zaniola out on the on the right-hand side. And, and at the weekend, we saw Wolves went straight into Keefield from, the, from minute one. Keep us back, get second balls, win territory that way. So... Let's see if Chelsea try to do something similar. I don't think they will. But yeah, let's see what they do. But I think for us against them, I just want to make sure that we have a similar core group again. Didn't bother me if it's the same team. Didn't it didn't worry me. I do have a concern about Spurs' speed in wide areas, but Chelsea, not so much speed. It's more how can we control the ball. If it is Zinchenko, it is Zinchenko, and we, and we control the game and get the game state and shut the game down. You know, so... Mm. We we tried that against Villa and, and we and trust our toe this time didn't go in, you know. And if he if he does that, we are in a different place as as a club, you know. So um, yeah. hey, look, I don't mind what we do, mate. Long as we uh, long as we continue the same focus we showed at Wolves because it was good, you know. At a time we could have felt sorry for ourselves, I thought it was really good. Yeah, I I can't decide how I feel about what we saw at Wolves, what it means for what we'll see against Chelsea, my suspicion is Jorginho comes back in. Maybe Zinchenko mm. comes back in. Kai moves back to number nine. Martinelli comes back in and, you know, runs that left side ragged with Zinchenko having access to to play him in. I, I don't know. I suspect that's what might happen. I still think we're the better team no matter who we put out. They, they do carry a threat, especially if Cole Palmer plays. But your point is they are shocking at the back and we... I think what we need at the Emirates is the supportive energy, not the nervous energy. As I've always said, it is not my job to tell fans how to fan, but against Villa, that energy felt <clears throat> nervy. We need it to feel, you know, just more full throated in this game yeah. to help lift the energy levels. Cause to your point, the one thing that is beyond question is that these players are tired, you know, Saka, you can see it. Odegaard, I think you see it a bit. Declan Rice at the end of the game, you saw it, but this is how it goes. As I mentioned earlier, the good teams play their best players at this stage of the season, Clive. So, I mean, I think we can win the title. Like, whisper it. I think we can. I, there's no reason we can't beat Chelsea and can't beat Spurs and can't beat United. All those games taken together 
feel like a lot, but Clive is the message that Mikel just has to drum into these players. Now, the most important message, one game at a time. Don't think about whether you can win the five remaining games. Think about whether you can beat Chelsea. Then think about whether you can beat Spurs. Then think about whether you can beat Bournemouth. Because in any one of these games, one off, I like our chances. So is that the key now? With five games to play, don't think of them as a cluster of five games, just one game at a time. Yeah, just think about the Chelsea one is the next one. It's going to be the toughest one because it is the next one. That's it. But they have a short turnaround too, right? So there's no excuses there. I think the schedule is a whole other discussion. It's a whole podcast in itself, really. But the fact that we have Spurs and a, a, a massive disadvantage at the weekend is, a, is another story itself. But if we do get through these next two games, we can sit there and say, okay, we're in the, we turn the corner now. You know, and I think... It, it sounds crazy. A week off now is like a rest, you know. And we're going to have a chance to have that bit of time to have a to have a think and a look. Chelsea, I think it's it's on, mate. It's on for us to beat them. Spurs, different entity. It's just a completely different game. It's not like a normal game. The fans were edgy against Villa. The fans were edgy against Bayern. And the reason why that we can look on the pitch and we can see. They had a good matchup in certain areas. They had a good matchup physically. They had a good matchup experience wise, and it becomes like, okay, this is real. And the fans know, and the mistakes get over indexed against Chelsea. I think, I think we're better than them. I think we'll all feel it, and I think we'll support them accordingly to get over the line. Spurs is the one, mate, and I don't think there'll be any spare tickets flying around for that one at the weekend. That's for sure. Yeah, well, <laughs> and going to that stadium is no fun. So, no, nope. we'll just have to see how it plays out. Look. It is it is a weird situation to go from the disappointment of the defeat against Villa and the disappointment of the defeat against Bayern to suddenly finding yourself in a position to go four points above City with four games to play. City obviously still having six games to play in that position, but it will change the psychology of the run in a lot if we can do it. And I, I think in the abstract, when you look at any one of these individual games we're playing, I like our chances in them. You know, everybody knows the odds of winning all five may not be as high as you'd like, but in any one game, I think we will be favorites and I think we should be favorites. So I I do think it's still there for us. And it is it is probably going to be the case that Mikel's going to have to push the key players to the limit to get us there. But I think he can do it. So, you know, I think we we leave it there. We'll have an instant reaction live after the Chelsea game tomorrow. Um then maybe what we'll do is some patron content on Wednesday and we'll have our regular Thursday main pod to cover the Chelsea game and look ahead to the Spurs game. We'll have a little more information at that point to do it. And I've had some time to really digest and dissect what's happened, including um, you know, what happens in the Liverpool game on Wednesday. City don't even play till Thursday. So yeah, that's going to change things a lot as well. Um, and so here we go. It's, it's still on. I mean, if you wanted anything in football, you want to be in the title race with five games to go. And we very much are. Uh, and hopefully we'll still feel that way with four games to go. So big, big chance to take another step towards something special. We'll leave it there. Um, Clive's on Twitter. Clive PFC. Thank Clive. Thank you very much. My name's Alex Smith. You can block me on Twitter. You can help us get to that target on the fundraiser with just, I think what I say, nine grand to go or something like that. And then we're, we're there. We're home free. Uh, and it's last week to do it. And then we will announce the winner of the drawing. So big game tomorrow. Hope you enjoy it wherever you are. We love you. We will talk to you after Arsenal 10. Chelsea, no.